Thank you. I will now officially close the AGM and pass over to Jack to introduce Sarah. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your support. Um, I first met Sarah when I was in the States a few years ago. Hi, Sarah. Nice to have you here. Um, and I think I met her first when I was in Mexico and went to El Rosario, which is one of the overwintering habitats. And then I caught up with her later when I was back in the States. And that time was at Kansas University where both Sarah and I were presenting to the people there. And Sarah had gone all the way from Mexico up to Canada. And I think she was on her way back down again. Is that right, Sarah? I was still headed north. You were still headed north, yeah. So, and, and um, I got to know Sarah a little bit better when I started reading her posts and I sent her an email to say, Sarah, I think you've spelt this word wrong. And uh, I, I'm one of these people that when you're reading something and you come to a word that's wrong or you come to it's with an apostrophe when it's not meant to be an apostrophe, I stop and think, oh God, I can't go any further without fixing this. So- um, Like that too, uh, <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got in touch with Sarah and Sarah said, oh, would you, would you like to read some more and, and proofread it? And I said, I'd be delighted to because her, her writing is it's one of the best I've ever read. It just keeps me hooked listening to what she's experienced. And um, I was happy to edit as I, as I went. So anyway, with, without further ado from me, here's Sarah. Jackie, um, are you guys good to keep moving or keep going or do you need like a little coffee break or anything? No, we're fine. Traffic? I've got, okay. I've got more. You guys are, are powerhouses. Okay. Well, thanks for letting me come and join your meeting. My, my goal kind of in life at this point is to be a voice for animals, right? They, they can't vote, they can't call the president, they can't rally to save a species, but so that kind of becomes our job. And anytime I can help spread the word, anytime I can be the voice, especially for the monarch, then I jump, I jump at it. So yeah. thanks Jackie for making this happen, for giving me a platform. And with that, I'm actually gonna just share a screen. It'll be way more interesting than me. And hopefully you all can see a monarch butterfly. Sure can. So my, my goal over the next like 40 minutes or so, or 35 minutes is to give a little intro to monarchs, at least monarchs in the United States for folks that are North America, for so, folks that don't know, talk about bike touring and then tell stories about my bike ride following the monarchs and then uh, jump in and, and answer questions. It's a small group, so if anyone feels, feel free to interrupt. If you have a specific question, I'm, I'm ready for them. So this is a monarch. All of you guys, I know there's monarchs in New Zealand, but in case you don't know, this is a male monarch. He has these scent glands on his hind wings. And he's really, or all the monarchs are, are really the, the point of my bike ride. They're the, the story, the heroes of my story. They're, just so beautiful. I'm like, I'm like, I look at this one, I like pause. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so pretty. And then the other thing that you need to know about is the the host plant of the monarch is milkweed. And monarch adults are generalists, so they'll nectar on all sorts of flowers. And so it's actually really important when we're talking about conservation of monarchs to not just talk about milkweed, but talk about all the native plants that they nectar on. But as far as the uh, juveniles go, the caterpillars only eat milkweed. So only food source. There's about 70 species in North America. So they have a lot of options. Most stewards kind of push three or four different species. It kind of depends on where you live in uh, the United States and Canada as, as far as what species. This happens to be one of those. It's, it's common name is swamp milkweed. And they're so beautiful. I was like every, every mile or kilometer, excuse me, I pedaled was always like, I was just so grateful that as I was like preaching the word of the monarch, that what I was asking people to do is plant a beautiful flower. Like it's not a huge ask. These plants are, are super beautiful. Sarah, can so I? So that's, that's um, uh, can a little I, bit yes. of the background of the monarch. And then this is, I want to also go into the range of the monarch. So this is 
um, the range of the North American monarchs at least, and it's color coded by season. So we have the yellow is where they live in the summer, green is where they live in the spring, orange is fall, and then winter is blue. And you can see the summer range is massive, pretty much extends over all of of the United States and Southern Canada. And then the winter range is really, really tiny. And that's one of the things that makes the monarch so, so special is that they really spread out during the summer months and which, which means they, they visit all sorts of people. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But then in the winter, they go to these forests. Most, the most common place is the forest in Mexico, in the state of Mexico and Michoacan. And they'll go there and they'll cluster in the trees and there'll be so many on the tree branches that they'll sometimes break from the weight of butterflies. And I have a few photos of that, don't worry. But I, what I wanna call to attention, something I think that's really interesting is that you'll see that the Rocky Mountains here in the, in the Western central part of the United States, there's, they're not colored. This is kind of acts as a, as a fence between these two populations. So we have an Eastern population that overwinter in Mexico, and then we have a Western population that overwinter in California. And it's, it's interesting because I use the word population and scientifically speaking, a population means genetically distinct. The Eastern and Western monarchs aren't there. So there is going to be overlap. And if you, if you look really closely, you'll see that there's some lines. We're still figuring out these patterns and these movements, but it seems that these, all these populations are interbreeding. Now, this is the route of my migration. And as I kind of alluded to before, since the monarchs spread out and visit lots and lots of people, that gave me the perfect excuse pretty much to go anywhere. So as long as I was like in Texas in the spring and say New York in the summer or Minnesota in the summer, as long as I was in the right states at the right times, I, every single road was that of the monarch. So I really had a lot of flexibility. And with that flexibility, you'll see lots of zigzags on my route. And pretty much every zigzag was to take advantage of an opportunity, of take advantage of an invitation. So I really tried hard on my trip to, to always say yes. Of course, there are limitations. I remember I, I really wanted to say yes to a presentation in North Dakota, but North Dakota's here and you could see my route wasn't anywhere near North Dakota. And eventually I just had to say, no, I, I can't pedal that much farther. That would have added weeks of biking. So I tried to say yes as much as possible, but the, the general route is, was um, starting in Michoacan in March, heading north up into Canada, big loop over to the East Coast before swinging back to Mexico in November. Um, the monarchs were a little faster than me. My, one of my jokes, I have a lot of jokes from lots of time talking with people. One of them was, I'm slower than a butterfly, but faster than a caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was behind the monarchs, but I still was seeing lots and lots. In fact, I saw more of the southbound time through Mexico than pretty much anywhere else on my tour. I only saw about one and a half, mon or on average, I saw about one and a half monarchs a day. But along the way, I was giving presentations to schools and Oh, well, presentations to all, all sorts of people, mostly at schools. And my, one of my favorite lines, and it was always at the end, I always say, I didn't see a monarch every day, but every day I saw the people that could help. And so again, it comes back to this idea that I did this route to learn about monarchs, to, to kind of to study them and to, to meet the people that were taking care of them. But I really did this to be their voice and to call to attention. It, it always amazed me that I could be at a front of a grocery store and someone would be like, you biked from Mexico? And then I'd be like, yeah, but this little insect, this little, this little insect can do that. And I think we forget how amazing the creatures in our own backyards are. And I think it takes people like, like you and I that love butterflies to, to call them to attention. So the only other thing I wanna say about the migration that's just really, really spectacular is that the monarchs I started with in March were not the same monarchs I finished with. So what makes this, unique, this migration so unique and different from where other, other monarchs live around the world is that this is a multi-generational migration. Meaning- Sarah, Sarah can I ask, uh, to be migrating so far, what's their longevity? Uh, well, that, that's actually, I think I could throw that into this part of, of this, we'll answer that question. 
because well, that's a, that's a really in, in, another incredible aspect. So because it's multi generational, there's some monarchs that live a short amount of time, and there's one generation every winter that lives a long time. So the monarchs that are born in the fall, they're they're born all over the summer range and even this this lower bit in the in the fall, and it's based. It's seemingly like some variable that corresponds with um, the sun, with sunlight, that they will fly to Mexico. Now, normally when the monarch ecloses from a chrysalis, they will be become sexually active about four days later. But these monarchs born in the fall don't. They, it's called sexual diapause. So they basically pause their reproductive development and they fly all the way to Mexico. Then they spend all winter in Mexico. So that's November, December, January, February, and March. So about five months. And then they, in, in the spring, in March, they head north to Texas where they lay their eggs and they die. So those monarchs, it's, it's often referred to as the super generation or the overwintering generation. They'll live about eight months. Their kids, that will be, they'll be known as the first generation of the season. They'll go through their metamorphosis They'll become reproductive about four days after becoming an adult and they'll live two to four weeks. So eight months versus a month about. And Which while those monarchs are living their two and a half weeks, they're breeding, they're laying eggs on milkweed and they're traveling north. And they'll lay their eggs and they'll die. And it takes about two to three generations to get to the summer range. And then by then they, they're they not migrants at this point. They just kind of, they, they're resident, they, they do their thing about in the same spot because they have what they need. And then of course the fall comes and they migrate south. So it depends on um, mostly on the weather and microclimates as to how many generations, but it's typically three to five generations to make the whole loop. So when I was biking south in Texas and I saw a, a, an adult butterfly, I'd have these moments where I'm like, did I see your great, great grandma? Like, did I, did I see or did I meet your grandma on a milkweed and some other other state, which is just so profoundly amazing. I mean, just to think that every butterfly has to have the genetic code to be born pretty much anywhere along their range and know what to do depending on the season is is really extraordinary. So that's that's about the migration. I or that's a little bit of, of the ecology and a little bit about bike touring. I do want to talk about what bike touring is because I don't know if you guys have all seen a bike tourist before. But this was my setup and I'm actually biking. This is a stage photo. I'm biking behind some really beautiful common milkweed. But you can see my bike is nothing special. In fact, it's special because it's nothing special in my opinion. I specifically built a bike many years ago that was strong and sturdy and was nothing fancy. So I, it's reliable. And then also I can um, put my bike up against a wall to go in and get groceries and be pretty confident no one's going to want to steal it because they're like, that's a piece of trash. Um, and, it, and, you know, I use that to my advantage. And then on my bike, I have these panniers and the front ones are store bought. They have my sleeping bag, sleeping pad, computer, book. I, I basically in presentations would tell kids the front was my office and my bedroom. And then the back was my kitchen and my workshop. So I have everything to cook. I usually carried about a day's worth of food. I had tools for general maintenance. I have strapped on the back there, both my tent and a little camp, a folding camp chair. So I'd always tell kids, I have a sofa. And then they'd all roll their eyes and be like, that's not a sofa. But it actually really helped because along my trip, one of the hardest things about my trip was scheduling presentations. So I'd set, every night I'd set up my tent and then I'd get out my little camp chair and I'd get on my computer and I would just be working on logistics. And that, that camp chair was as, as important as a water bottle, honestly, on my trip. But what I, what I love about this setup, and there's lots of different types of bike tourists and different ways of traveling by bike. The what, what I love about my way, which is being self-sufficient and having everything you need and carrying everything, is that I didn't need a lot of a plan. So like when I left Mexico, I had a general sense of where I was gonna go, but I didn't plan out where I was gonna stay every night. And I didn't even plan on which roads I was gonna take. It kind of, I would ask people, I would get an invitation to go somewhere at a grocery store and I'd, I'd kind of just like go with the flow as much as possible. 
And so in doing, so in having the setup and doing that, I, I just, I did just eat when I was hungry, just pull over, have a snack, camp when I was tired. This is called stealth camping often, at least that's what my friends and I call it. And you'll see my tent is here behind this tree. And then there's the highway right there. And this is in Texas where there's private property in Texas is religion. And so there were these fences. So I often just had to use right of ways and easements for roads. But I, I just hid in plain sight. And people are always like, oh my gosh, that's so scary. But I felt so safe doing this because one, I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one's looking for someone. There's no opportunities for, you know, some high school kids to drive down the road looking for a, a drinking spot. There's no road. So I, I always just felt really safe, way safer than I would at a campground. And I also love this because it bonded me to the experience of the monarch. And I think it really called to attention what monarchs need. And that's habitat, right? So uh, along my trip, every single night about dusk, I would have to start looking for a place to camp. And some nights it was perfect. There'd be some public land, there'd be the flat spot, everything I need. And it was like, yes. And then there were the nights where I'd have to bike two or three extra hours and, and find a marginal spot. And the monarchs are the same, right? Every single night they need a new place to stay. So we can't just protect their overwintering habitat in Mexico or their summer breeding habitat in Canada. We have to protect every spot in between. And that means giving them habitat. And there are lots and lots of ways to provide this and I'll, I'll get into it more. But I really loved that on my trip, I could, I could feel what it felt like to be a migrant or a traveler and not have what they needed. And it's, it's scary and hard. Another great thing about my way of traveling is it's super easy to clean your house. Um, I, I only have a clean house when I, when I camp in a tent and have to pack it every day. And then another great thing was finding creatures along the way. My story was about monarchs. My focus was about monarchs, but of course there's so many creatures. And sometimes I would just be a, just astounded by all the all the creatures I found and and how every single one of them you could write a book about and how every single one of them has a story worth telling but we're so busy and we are so unobservant so much of the time that they just they go unnoticed and and biking is just so great because you go slow enough that not only do you have the opportunity to spot creatures but you also it's really easy to stop I just drove across the U.S. to to get back to California, and so many times I was just kept thinking about how I, in my presentation I'm like slow down, and so many times I'm going pretty fast down the the interstate and I'm like oh that'd be cool to check out, but but it was just it's impossible to stop. It's, it's not even really safe. So biking just gives you just builds an opportunity for these interactions. This is a little a little western toad by the way, a little toadlet that I spotted crossing the road. And another great thing about bike touring is just all the random interactions. So I guarantee if I'd been driving through Mexico, this man would not have stopped me. <laughs> or if I'd been on a bus or a plane or whatever. But biking, it, you're so vulnerable out there. It gives people the opportunity to be vulnerable back. So this man I met in Mexico, I was just biking down the super boring highway. It was so hot. And he stops and my first reaction was like, oh boy, what does this guy want? But then he's like, hey, do you want some ice cream? And again, I always try and say yes. Even if I'm in a hurry, man, you're not gonna remember the, the, the miles or the kilometers or the distance or whatever it is, but you are gonna remember these interactions. So of course I stopped, it was delicious. It wasn't just um, these spontaneous encounters. Biking also, because people um, related to my story and because people love monarchs, word started to spread. And friends and friends of friends would, would email me or call me and say, hey, I have a school, would you come to a presentation? Or, oh, I have a, a garden, will you, do you wanna come visit? Or, hey, I will call the media and I will get the, every single radio station and newspaper here if you come. And so again, I'd try and say yes. And th this is one of those such encounters. This is Margaret from Canada. And she was a friend of a friend and she has a dairy farm. And she invited me to stay at her dairy farm. And then she invited me for homemade ice cream. And I said, yes, oh, it was so good. But 
this had I oh, excuse me I stayed with like 68 families on my tour so the reason I chose this one is because I love this photo because in the foreground Margaret's feeding me and then in the background that's that's her backyard and it's full of wildflowers so again just like I felt the pain and of being a traveler without habitat I also felt the joy of being a traveler just like the monarchs did and arriving to Margaret's house and having what they need. And uh, it's just, it, it was such a gift to, to find these places. And honestly, without people like Margaret, my trip wouldn't have been possible. But the last reason that I loved bike touring to follow the Monarchs was because it, it trained my eye to see, to see every single moment as a Monarch might. So I'd be biking down the road and I'd catch a glimpse of common milkweed. I don't know, some of you might be able to see the common milkweed in this photo. And I'd slam on my brakes. And because my bike isn't fancy and it's super strong and steel, I could just throw it on the ground. And then I'd run over to the milkweed and I'd start looking for caterpillars. And this was a, a super interesting encounter I had. So for folks that haven't noticed yet, this is the common milkweed. And then on the milkweed here is a fifth instar caterpillar. So this is about as big as they get. And I actually can zoom in. And I stood and watched and photo photographed this monarch for probably about half an hour. And the most interesting thing was happening where they'd pick up their frass, which is the fancy science word for poo. They'd pick up their frass and then start swinging like a crane and then basically throw it over the leaf. And my guess as to why this has happened, I, I need to ask someone, but my theory is that this is, a, this is anti, an anti-predator behavior because basically I'm a predator, right? I'm looking for caterpillars. And when I would spot milkweed, I would not look for caterpillars, but I'd actually look for the, the calling cards of the caterpillar. So I would cue in to frass, or if you look really closely in this photo, there's a hole with some white sap. That's the milkweed's uh, sap. I'd cue into those, and then I'd look more closer for caterpillars. So I'm imagining the caterpillars getting rid of this frass, to help make them more camouflage and not get predated. Of course, the drawback to seeing every single mile like a monarch is, is that I felt viscerally when choices were made that were not helpful to the monarch. And so I would be biking down the road, seeing milkweed and seeing monarchs, and then I'd come to this, a, a road getting mowed. And we, of course, can mow roads, but if we choose the right time of year, then it benefits the monarchs and me. <laughs> and every single day I saw choices made that were, that were made without any consideration of the world around us. And I was honestly really angry on my trip. And it's hard not to get angry when you fall in love with an animal and then you bike for thousands and thousands of miles along a road that's just been mowed and all the eggs and all the caterpillars have just been displaced or killed. And it wasn't just roadsides, it was everywhere. And in all of these pictures in the suburbs and in front of schools and, and farmlands, all the people that are making the choices to grow these lawns are making this choice because they wanna be good neighbors. At least in the United States, I, I can't speak for New Zealand, I've never been there, but this is like, if you don't have this green grass that you're looked upon as a pariah and that you're being bad and you're un, everything's unkept and it's ugly. And man, we have got to change that, that uh, paradigm. We have got to, to change the narrative because right now all these, this grass is the only people or the only animals that are benefiting are human. And we need to think about what it means to be a good neighbor to butterflies and be a good neighbor to frogs and to snakes and to birds. And right now growing grass, that is just, we're being good neighbors to, to only humans. And that's a problem. And, and here's the, the truth. This is the Eastern monarch population. And don't worry about the numbers. Um, what's important is just to notice the trend. So all populations of the wild go up and down. But the problem is that over the course of the last 30 years, the trend has been downward. And down leads to zero, down leads to extinction. And it's not going to be the extinction of the monarch as a species, but it will be the extinction of this multi-generational, multinational migration. And- Sarah, Sarah yeah. what, what was different about 1995 through to 1997? 
where the numbers are double, treble, the average. Right. What was special? What was different? So there's a few things going on that would explain this number. One is is just the, the, the way that they count the monarchs. You'll notice this says 18.9. That doesn't mean there were 18 monarchs. I think this, yeah, this is in hectares. So they count the monarchs as by area in Mexico. And there's some, there's some debate whether some years when it's colder, the monarchs clump more close, they're more dense. So they're closer together. They, they occupy more or less space, excuse me, but there might actually be more. And then some years they spread out. In the beginning of counting, there wasn't as specific of a protocol. So that yeah. could explain some of this. The other, other thing that would is also likely is that these early counts, they just weren't counting all the monarchs. They weren't finding all the colonies. There's multiple colonies. And then of course, this is 1993. And by 1993, there was already, the United States was already bombarded by GMO crops. And the issue with GMO crops is prior to the 90s, there was lots and lots of milkweed. In fact, corn was the best thing that the milkweed ever had because milkweed is a disturbance species. So all of a sudden, most of the prairie has been disturbed by the plow. And so milkweed was flourishing in between the corn rows. And once the corn had, had emerged, farmers couldn't spray with any herbicides or pesticides because that would have killed the corn. Well, in the 90s, GMOs were invented, which meant they would plant that specific corn that could withstand whatever herbicide they were spraying on the field. So all of a sudden the corn could grow, the milkweed could grow, but then everything would get sprayed and only the corn would survive. So, oops. So the numbers prior to 1993 are probably astronomically larger and they were probably more, more up at this level. Of course, we, we, won't, we won't ever know, but we can look to these other years and we can see that regardless of if this is a little off one way or the other, it's still way less. And the main factor for this is habitat loss. So when you get rid of all the farm fields and when you start developing every single year, the, the, the organization that came out with this map or this graph, excuse me, was Monarch Watch. And Monarch Watch estimates that, I'm, I'm gonna, someone's gonna need to type into Google a, a change and I'll just keep going. Um, about 6,000 acres are lost every year to habitat loss. That's not right. 6,000 acres a day, excuse me, are lost to habitat um, for the monarch. So we're just developing the heck out of the monarch's range. And this number, there were probably a billion monarchs or so at least. And if you think about it, half of those are females and each female is laying between three and 500 eggs. And she doesn't wanna lay every egg on the same milkweed because the, the caterpillars would eat it in, in a moment. So instead she wants to a lay one egg per milkweed. So if you have a million or a billion monarchs and half of them are females and they're each laying 500 eggs, you can just start to understand the, how much milkweed we need. we need. We need billions of stems of milkweed in order to maintain this population. And then as far as maintenance goes, there is this dotted green line. That dotted green line is where scientists believe the population could be stable. And you can see that in, in the last few decades, we have not reached that line hardly at all. So very disconcerting. There's lots of reasons to, to, to be upset and scared. And, you know, I think it's hard to hear this. And it was hard for me to bike every single day knowing this. But I guess at this point, we have two options, right? It's either we get really sad and we curl up in a ball, which is sometimes what I do. But then the other option is to like try and be part of the solution and try and do something. Because even doing something is better than nothing. And not just for the monarchs, but for our own well-being. And, and so that kind of shifts to the, the next part, is, which is like, how do we find hope and how do we keep moving? And how do we make a difference? And for me, I don't have a lot of land. I don't have any land. So for me, it was about using my voice. So like I said, I, I spoke to kids along my route, got them excited about science, about adventure, about living not status quo because status quo is killing us all. Um, and 
it really brought me a lot of joy. And it wasn't just in the classrooms. I would go out after presentations and visit school gardens and be completely inspired by the work that teachers are doing. This is a school garden in Omaha, Nebraska. And we found a bunch of eggs. Well, first we found little milkweed sap and the, the sap of a milkweed is poisonous. And for most herbivores, they don't wanna eat it, but the monarchs can actually sequester that poison in their bodies, which renders them poisonous as adults. So the first, we first we saw these, like someone must have ripped a little leaf. And so milkweed was oozing out and it looked like a leaf. And we all just were like going nuts. And then of course we realized it was poison, which made us go even more nuts. And then we found eggs. So these gardens are so important and so special and there's so much work to maintain one of these school gardens is, is a job. And, but it's a really important job. And so I encourage folks that, that have family members in school or live near a school, if you have the time and the energy, if you can get one of these gardens going, it, it really makes a huge difference to kids and gives them such an amazing opportunity. And then there's the farmers I met. This is Bill, he is a farmer in Texas and he started his career just like landscaping. And one day he was like, you know, watering and spraying and mowing all these lawns and was like, what am I doing? And he ended up creating a, a farm called Native American Seed, which he grows natives now, harvests the seeds and then sells the seeds. And I stayed on his farm twice and it was spectacular. I will never forget going down the driveway and just seeing milkweed growing in rows, like, like a crop. It was so exciting. And then his daughter, Emily came out and was like, I stocked the guest room or the guest house fridge for you, a, a miracle. Um, so that gave me a lot of hope. And then there's like these little moments where I'm biking. This is an Iowa. Excuse Iowa. me, Sarah. Yeah. Can you go back yeah. to that previous photo? What was the flower? Is that yarrow or Achillea? It starts with a V. V, okay. We'll work on that one, thank you. Yeah, I'll, for, for really, I'm actually pretty terrible with flowers. Okay, I, no have, I have to ask before I embarrass myself. Looks like verbenas, Jackie. Verbena. Hmm. And Jackie, it's true that the milkweed in North America is different than the milkweed in New Zealand, right? I'll, I can clarify, it, it's different. Ours comes from Africa, but they do have um, swan plant in America, in, in the States. So the monarchs in New Zealand are sustaining themselves on a different species. Well, or a different plant, right? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, swan, yeah. Pl swan plant in New Zealand is the main host plant, yes. Yeah. It comes yeah, from Africa, different. but it is a milkweed. Yeah, it's you just wonder, the well, they look very different. Not that mm -hmm. I, you know, Sarah, for the interruption, yeah. please continue. Sorry. Oh, that, no, that's that's a good question. The the milkweeds, the characteristic, all milkweeds have these. Let's see. If I go, go back. Oops, I didn't want to stop sharing. I just wanted to go back. Um, all the milkweeds have these characteristic. Um, like shooting star flowers, but their leaves can look extraordinarily different. And not even all of them, you can rip some of them and there won't even be any of that latex sap. So they're, they're a pretty diverse genus of plants. Our swan plants are big bowls, huge bowls. Yeah, they, their colors are, are I, could, I could fast forward to, oh wait, don't worry, not all of these. <laughs> are um, in my presentation. I don't ever delete a, a picture. I just move them around. This is also, this is another type of milkweed called, um, the Uberosa. common name is butterfly weed. Yeah. And that, and Sarah, that you'd be interested to know that's a prohibited plant in New Zealand. Oh, wow. It's, on a, an, it's never been in New Zealand, but it's on the list of, you must not grow or encourage its growth in New Zealand for some strange reason. Huh, interesting. And another point, we do have quite a few American milkweeds for sale, seeds for sale on our website, folk, if you want a bit of variety in your garden. And that one is Syriaca, is that correct? Yeah, this is common milkweed. And this We're one- hoping some people sell that this year too. This, this one is a, a spreader, but 
for me at this point, I mean, common milkweed is, is native to the US and it's my favorite plant at this point. And the, the blossoms smell so amazing. And I've, I saw so much common milkweed on my trip. If When I see one now, it feels like I'm seeing a friend. I'm almost like, oh, milkweed. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's lots of species. So I, I'm, I can't speak to the specific specifics of New Zealand, but I would say that it's in the same genus, not the same species. <clears throat> So let's see, where was I here? You guys are getting a sneak peek. Oh yeah, so I was just talking about, about finding hope and wherever, wherever we can get it really. Let's see if I can't get my... Sarah, are you, are you hopeful? I mean, those um, the sustainability levels not being met for two decades, um, could they all disappear within 20 years? And that goes for all moths and butterflies. And in terms of loss of habitat, we have the same thing in New Zealand with, um, paddocks being, the trees are being removed for, um, to help irrigators. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's chronic here as well. I, but, I mean, I feel like that's sort of the point of my book is me wrestling between deep despair and anger and then hope. Yeah. And if I didn't have hope, I wouldn't have been able to do the trip because I would have just been too mad and too angry. And, and so I guess, the, the issue is right now, there's still millions of monarchs in the United States. The issue is if there's a freak storm, which are becoming more frequent, especially if there was a freak storm in Mexico, if there's too much drought, the monarchs do seem to be adapting in a lot of ways. So they're moving further north as the milkweed advances further north. They're, they're kind of changing where they, where they go in the summer, especially. So, so there, are, there are indications that there might be some flexibility, but again, there's, especially in Mexico, they're so vulnerable to any disturbances. And so it could be a freak storm that kills 80%. And then if 80% if of a million isn't very much compared to 80% of a billion. And so those, I guess to answer if you're if I'm hopeful or not, I I'm not <laughs> I'm not, but I we have to try. At least that that's the only way I could get out of bed, and and care is and yeah. or and not just curl up in a ball is to try. And on my trip, man, so many times I mean too many times a couple times a day an, an older person would approach me and they'd say monarchs eh? Man, when I was a kid we used to see lots of monarchs, <laughs> and it was, it just got so old and so annoying because it was like, okay, so the, the generations before me got to see this beautiful phenomenon and then they, they plowed the prairie to death. They poisoned the land and now there's not monarchs and, and the next generation, there might not be any. And so I was, and that actually leads me to the next slide. This, this woman, Diane, she, Diane, excuse me, she, what instead of telling me I used to see lots of monarchs she was like yeah I used to see lots and I rallied hard and in the 80s we fought to protect this prairie this is in Iowa again there's like 0.01 percent remnant prairie 0.01 percent the rest has been plowed 0.01 percent <laughs> that's just so little and so it takes people fighting and when I would meet someone especially an older person that had done something it just it, it filled it filled me with joy it filled me with hope and and took away some of that anger and and it really was just me it was just me bouncing from I'd be filled with hope after like leaving Sioux City and then I'd bike into the corn and I wouldn't see a monarch for a couple of days and I'd be so angry and then I'd meet a, meet someone caring again and it was a roller coaster um, and it the the mental aspect of my trip was by far far harder than any physical part. Um, but that leads me to, I think the, probably the biggest bit of hope I have is that there are so many people that are share, beginning to share. And I have two examples. The first is from Tulsa. This is Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I love this example because it's such a good example of sharing. We've got a patio, we have grass for the dog and kids, we've got some um, some ornamentals because they're pretty, and then we have these native common milkweed. 
And at first when I showed up, I was like, oh, that's kind of, that's, I guess something, you know, I was, I wasn't like, wow. But then Amy said she'd already seen 40 eggs on these milkweeds and most won't survive. That's okay. We need bird food. We need frog food, but some will. And because this is early in this, in the season, by the, and even if just one of those eggs survives, that's 500 eggs in the next generation, which could be thousands of more eggs in the next generation. And so when I think about hope, I, I think about how there are people all over the United States, Canada, the world that are planting these native gardens and, and learning to share. And the monarch would have disappeared, I, I think, if it hadn't been for these people stepping up. And you can't go anywhere in the United States without someone talking about monarchs. Like they are, they are heroes and people know about them because so many people have started planting gardens and becoming examples. Monarchs are used to teach about life cycles and classrooms. They are, I mean, they are the spokesperson of the Midwest, of the natural world. And I mean, I, I am lifted by how much people care. And so speaking of those examples, this is one of my favorite gardens that I visited. This is Nadia's garden in Columbia, Missouri. And I stopped at her house on the fall migration. And I actually don't have a good picture of her yard. Her yard is everything behind her. But what I love about this picture is again, coming back to that idea of being an example. And you can see her neighbor's yard, just a bunch of grass. But then there's this common milkweed sprouting here. And I asked Nadia about it and she said, well, first her, her neighbors mowed everything. And then they learned that without milkweed, there could be no monarchs. And so they started mowing around this milkweed. And so I think, I wonder where they, they found out about milkweed being important. And it was probably from Nadia and all this milkweed she's growing in her yard. And so we need to have an example of sharing, of planting native plants, of encouraging native butterflies and, and all the animals that, that live and then share the, our planet with us to share our yards as well. So we need someone like Nadia to be that example. And if there's an example like that on every street, then literally the natives can spread and just as the ideas spread. And I, I just think that's, well, that, that's where I get hope is, wa is watching the ideas take root. My, my parents wouldn't even let me have a dog growing up because dogs pee and then make, turn the grass yellow, apparently. Um, but now my dad has some, some milkweed in his backyard. So he's literally planting quote weeds in the backyard because he's heard about it and because, because we're changing what important meat is. So I've kind of talked way too much. I'm gonna, I wanna rush through a few more photos and just tell a few, I guess I would call them lessons that the monarchs gave us. And I think this continues to be about hope in a lot of ways. So this is a picture from Mexico of mo monarchs clustered on the branches. And this isn't the best photo I, I took, but what I love about this photo is in the background, you might be able to note this there's this tree here that's literally bent and it's a small tree granted but I guarantee you if there was just one monarch on that tree it would barely have even the, a needle would have barely have moved but here we have thousands of monarchs and their collective weight is breaking branches and and or at least bending them and I have seen branches break and so I think wow if it was just me or just Nadia or just Bill doing our thing we wouldn't make a big difference, but all of us together, we, we really are becoming more and more powerful. And I'm, I'm seeing the narrative change and I'm seeing action happen and I'm seeing less and less grass and it's going way too slow, but it's happening. And man, that's, it's certainly better to be going forward than backwards. And I think the monarchs teach us that. They teach us that we're, we all have to do a little to do a lot. And that's a very, and is it? Is that a, a very recent photo? This was in the last few years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when like those, those, those things where I said 18.9 or 18.2 hectares, that was 18.2 hectares of trees covered in butterflies like this. So mm -hmm. when there's 18 hectares, that's, that's billions of butterflies. Right. Right. 
it's very, very cool. And this is not even that concentrated. Like sometimes you'll go and you won't even see a needle. And you can see they're all along these trunks and way in the background there. Very, very spectacular. But then the best part is, oops, is when they start flying. And I'm gonna extend the metaphor of our all of our work adds up because when one butterfly goes by, I've not been able to hear it. But when millions take to the sky or at least thousands take to the sky on a warm day, you can hear their wings flapping. And it, it's like one of my favorite sounds at this point. And so I think, again, if it was just me talking, boy, I would not get very, I wouldn't give much traction. I wouldn't be heard by many people. But if I'm talking and if all of you are talking and if people that read my book pass the message on and if people that learn about the monarchs and whatever way that is can pass it along, then we become an unstoppable voice. And I mean, at this point, I don't think that you can go a day without without some monarch news story happening. I know because they're all forwarded to me. And and that's what it takes. It just takes hearing it over and over and over again and just changing the idea of what is important and what is beautiful. So I'm I I've as like I said, I've I keep I keep ran I'm very good at rambling. But um the other lessons I just want to talk about real quickly is that it doesn't matter where you live. Like if you, and it doesn't even, you know, it's kind of interesting because I'm talking to you all in New Zealand. It doesn't matter what the species is. It doesn't matter where you live. Like, well, in the United States, any anywhere you can plant natives, the monarchs will come. So this was in New York City. I was like, I was so flabbergasted when I saw this monarch in Manhattan, but that goes for any species. If you plant the native plants, then the native butterflies will come. The native pollinators will come, the native, birds will come and and I just think that's it's it's so beautiful that you don't have to live in a national park to support a butterfly and the, the last lesson that I want to speak to before we switch to questions is that the monarchs are just so beautiful and they're they're the guide to make us appreciate all small creatures so first you see the butterfly and then you start looking for the caterpillars and the eggs you cannot be driving down the interstate at 100 kilometers an hour to find this caterpillar. You have to really slow down. And then you start noticing all the other animals. These are tussock moths. Sometimes people think, oh no, some animal's eating my milkweed. I've got to save the monarchs and they'll start taking off all the other caterpillars. And it's like, no, no, no. All the natives are important. So these tussock moths also rely on milkweed. And if they eat your milkweed, they probably won't eat yours. I doubt they're in New Zealand. But if Another creature eats the milkweed. Well, great. That was another another creature saved. And you'll start to notice the uh, the other the other insects in the garden. This is a little googly-eyed spider. No idea of the species, but I think it's important to note. You know, sometimes I'll hear people say, "Oh, to save the monarchs, we have to save all the eggs, and we have to protect them from spiders and from ants and from wasps that parasitize them." But no, that I mean, the way we protect the monarch is by offering them lots and lots of habitat so they can lay lots and lots of eggs and for 95% to get eaten by spiders, but 5% 5, 5 of lots and lots is plenty. So the spiders are not the bad guys in this, in this equation. They're important because they feed all the other animals. And you'll start to notice the other pollinators. This is one of my favorite pollinators. Called, they're called hummingbird moths. And you'll notice the other creatures. This is a little froglet that just metamorphosed seeking refuge in a common milkweed leaf. And so it doesn't matter what animal you pick, right? It can be a frog or a bird or a butterfly or a moth or an ant, I don't care. Whatever animal that like speaks to you and like brings you joy, go offer that animal support and protection and your voice and you'll be protecting all the others. Um, frogs, by the way, are, are my, my passion. I, want to do a frog trip. I hope I hope to visit Jackie in New Zealand to find the um, oh shoot, what are they called? The Archie frog. Yeah, so you don't have to bike across Mexico or through New New York City. New York City was the hardest part of my trip. Or battles, roadside skunks in Canada. All you have to do is plant natives, plant milkweed, and the true adventures will come to you. 
And if it's not monarchs on bikes, it could be all the other butterflies that you, that you guys are helping protect. So with that, um, my website is beyondabook.org and there's lots and lots of photos. And my book is Bicycling with Butterflies. Jackie might be able to speak to if it's possible to get in New Zealand. <laughs> if not, I'll send you a pirated copy via, uh, don't tell anyone, <laughs> via electronic. But um, yeah, if anyone has more questions, I know we, you guys have been sitting a long time, so I appreciate it. Oops. I will uh, stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Sarah. Before anybody dives in with a question, I'll talk to Carol about maybe we could get some books here. We'll, we'll work out a price. And if you'd like to know more about that, um, I will send an email around everybody and say, could might you be interested if the price is within your budget? So look out for that email. I have read um, Sarah's book, and I've also just got it on um, from Audible as well, Sarah, and I'm enjoying mm. it twice as much now. It's wonderful. I don't know who's who the woman is that's reading it, but yeah, it takes me right back to conversations with you. So it's wonderful. Do we have that's any great. questions of Sarah? You can unmute yourselves if you have a question yourself. Whereabouts are you broadcasting from today, Sarah? Uh, I'm in a cabin in California. That's uh, explained that I had to steal the harshest light. For some reason, the, the electricity isn't working or the lights aren't working. Um, but I was in Kansas visiting my folks. I just returned to California. I'll, I'll work where I'm living here for a couple months doing outdoor ed work. And then in so June, the my job as an amphibian researcher starts back up. Oh, great. And what's Thanks. the time there, Sarah? Um, I don't know. Evening, my, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's dusk. Yep. So just to repeat, you did cover it, but could you just tell me again from the overwintering spot, um, how many generations to get back to that again? So to get to, in the fall, it's one generation back. Well, that's not, when you're talking about a billion animals, there's kind of a range. In general, from Mexico back to Mexico is three to five generations. Yeah. And I say that because like in 2017, when I did my trip, it was, an, a, there was this Southern wind that blew the monarchs further north. And at first I was like, oh great, this is good because that means they're, they're getting kind of a head start. But it was bad because the, the years with the most monarch population increase is when they can lay lots of eggs in early in, in March in Texas because it, it'll be warmer there. And since monarchs are cold blooded, if it's, the, if it's too cold, the eggs take way longer to develop. The caterpillars take longer to develop. The, the chrysalids take longer to develop. So the whole development process is drawn out. So you can go from, in ideal conditions, it takes about 30 days to go from an egg to an adult. But in 2017, since they were laid so far north, it was much colder. And so it was taking 40 days, which means there's 10 days that are just lost, right? As opposed to, if during those 10 days, if those 10 days hadn't happened, then they could have been breeding, laying more eggs and another generation could have been happening. So the ideal formula is more generations because then you get more recruitment and you get a higher number, which is, which is what would naturally happen, right? Because in Mexico, there's no recruitment. They're, they're not breeding at all. So the population is just naturally going down. There's always been storms that have killed a lot. There's interesting ecology that happens in Mexico. The, the trees act like an umbrella to protect the monarchs from storms. They also trap the heat to protect from the coldest, um, the coldest weather, the most extreme colds, but it's cold enough that they're not active. So they're being able to conserve their energy and they're able to kind of withstand or survive winter without starving by living off their fat reserves. So there's this very small line um, but regardless, lots and lots die. They starve, they get too cold, they get, they get eaten. There are birds and mice in Mexico that, that can actually eat monarchs. 
but hopefully with lots of recruitment with lots of generations in the spring and summer you can they can bounce back so that was a very that was a very long-winded answer to your question i'm not even sure i answered it <laughs> so sarah are these migrations uh, are they they're not commonplace or do you know whether there are whether they migrate does anyone know whether they we've got migratory patterns in new zealand i mean we're 1600 kilometers long we're very cold down south very warm up north. Um, does we, anyone know we have migration here? We were tagging them for many years here in New Zealand, Martin. And what we found was that they tend not to migrate. Um, mostly there are overwintering sites in um, as far south as Ormaru, um, Timaru, Christchurch. There are quite a few overwintering sites um, right up to the Butterfly Bay, I think, is the most north, which is near Cayo. Right. So there, are, there are overwintering sites in um, Nelson, um, but it's a bit too early for them to be overwintering yet. Yeah. And there are other species that have fantastic migrations. There's the painted lady, which migrates from North Africa up to the UK and Europe every year. So there are some amazing migrations. Mm. Mm. Good question. Thanks, Martin. Mm. Thank you, Jackie. I think what sets the Eastern Monarch migration apart is that multi-generational factor. And so even like in, in the West in the United States, there, there is a similar, but it's nowhere near as dramatic. Mm. So the monarchs are overwintering in California. And even that seems to be changing with, with climate change. The, the temperature is rising enough that the monarchs aren't being stimulated to emerge from their chrysalids and sexual diapause. So they're just becoming resident and they might be shifting with the seasons, but they're not necessarily migrating any, any distance anymore or not as much. It's still kind of, it's still, the changes are happening so fast. It's hard to tell what's a, a freak year versus what's a trend. Um, can I ask, please, um, two things. Is this session being recorded, so can it be replayed? Yes, it is being recorded, Fiona. Okay, because I'm just thinking, um, I'm on the west coast of the South Island, really isolated, uh, but Barrytown School have made a really big effort at growing swan plants and distributing them in the community this year. And Barrytown School's only little, it's only got 25 students. Um, and I'm sure that they would love to see this video it would help connect the students with why they've been really? working on swan plants this year so yeah that kind of hits both those balls with one stone because i was going to ask sarah if you talk to schools over zoom but if they could watch this that would save sarah the extra work um <laughs> but it would give them more of a clue yeah i'll get in touch with you later fiona mm -hmm. i've made a note perfect thank you i i started my trip well I started my trip with no plans to write a book. And then about halfway through, I just got so tired of people telling me there used to be lots of monarchs. that I was like, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> and I finished my trip and I was not a writer, but I just wrote and wrote and wrote and then edited and edited. And it took quite a while and I learned a lot. But my original draft, when I started, I wanted to write a book for 10 year olds because 10 year olds are the best. They have the best questions. They're the best audience. They're hilarious. And they also have a, a huge stake in the game, right? Their whole future is ahead of them. But my book, I just kept like, I don't, I don't need to put all my hope and anger on a kid. <laughs> so then it ended up being a book for adults, but I've gone back and I'm chain, I'm, I'm trying to write a book for kids and it's way funnier or way more funny. And um, a lot, a lot lighter. I mean, still, it, it talks about true issues, but in a, in a more fun way, I think, than this book is. So my dream is to write the book for kids, do a book tour where I visit schools. And then because I obviously I could, I couldn't do Zooms for every single school that would be interested. My thought is to do, is to like create a a 30 minute intro and then schedule uh, schedule zooms for question answers um with with kids so if they have any questions i'm ha I'm happy to jump on a zoom and answer questions i i just love 
the, the questions kids come up with are the best. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean when you meet older people who say, oh, yes, we used to see so many of them because Rob and I have experienced that with lots of elderly people who have said, oh, yeah, we used to see the Red Admiral in our gardens in Auckland all the time. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, they eat, their caterpillars eat stinging nettle. To, so trying to get people to plant stinging nettle in their gardens is a little more difficult. <laughs> we have a stinging nettle, stinging nettle in the United States. Yeah. And I, I made a little garden out of it. It's just, just such, at least the one in the US is super um, nutritious and you just freeze it and then it doesn't poke you anymore. But I had a friend and I had a little fence that said, don't touch, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm immune to that. And I'm like, no, you're not. He's like, I'm immune. And he just started grabbing it. And then he just goes, ow. <laughs> so, so, so this so is a garden you don't go into. He doesn't sting. Sorry. Um, Sarah, so this is a garden you don't go into. <laughs> it was, it was small. It was, you know, just a few, a few feet wide, yeah. but it's such a good plant for yeah. compost and for eating we we always would make nettle tea and nettle lasagna yeah, it's a good herb <laughs> yeah sarah can i ask if you recognize this piece of art <laughs> i think i do <laughs> <laughs> sarah sent me some beautiful artworks and um heather's been particularly helpful today so i'd like to present one to heather oh wow oh, thank you Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. An original, a Sarah Dykman original. Nice. I'll, I'll have to send some more. I haven't been watering coloring as much, but. You're very talented. Thank you. Have we got any more questions for Sarah? Sarah, well, thank you so much. You've been, you were here earlier, so you've even had to suffer the AGM before you gave you a chance to chat. But hopefully we'll little, learn a little bit about us in New Zealand, and we really want to keep in touch with you. So I'd love to see you down here at some stage, but just wonderful that we now know who you are and that you spent the time with us, and it's been wonderful to share your yeah. experience. So thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. You're fantastic. Happy to do thank it. You. Thank you. thank you very much thank you thanks for all you're doing for monarchs i do want or, and butterflies in general i i need to get down there and meet some of your butterflies brilliant we'll love you and do too. some biking you'll love the biking here sarah <laughs> very hilarious. i i all my friends hike go to new zealand for the hiking and oh the, well uh, that too. yeah <laughs> thanks everybody bye. thank you everybody great thank meeting you. Thank you. Bye. bye bye we look forward to working with you all this year. Bye.